Welcome! In this review we will give you a full tour of the all-new generation of the Mercedes GLE and this is also a special focus because recently on the Frankfurt Motor Show everyone was going in all-electric or PHEV versions and this one here is a special diesel plug-in hybrid with the biggest battery in the plug-in hybrid so far and also the highest range 100 kilometers or 60 miles pure electric range. Hmm, what about that? Let's test it out together here on Autogefühl. And as always, in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far, so you won't miss any new review. This one here, the new Mercedes GLE generation, is a little bit more modern, stronger in the front. This one here, the typical normal base front grille with this dual horizontal fin design. The AMG line would, for example, come with this beautiful diamond pin dot design, but this one, I may also works. This one is by the way all the way shut off because you don't need so much cooling than here in the lower area. Then this new daytime running light signature right there. LED standard and optional multi-beam LED also with 650 meters of high beam range. The color here for today is Kevin side blue. It's blue yes but I prefer a little bit brighter blues but still the elegant color. 4 meters 92, 194 inches or well, 16 foot 1 is the length here of the new GLE generation so it's a couple of centimeters longer than the previous version here with 20 inch wheels so this is the you know exactly in between is 18 to 22 inch and I think this is a good compromise between a nice visual already and still you have a lot of comfort already from that one so good ratio here also with the plastic wheel arches and the crossover cover you got the EQ power badge that signalizes that this one is also a plug-in hybrid vehicle other than that, it has a rather conservative design right there with this falling C pillar here. This one has been always, you know, characterizing here of the GLE SUV. What do you think about the design here of the new generation? The rear of the new GLE is characterized by those more horizontally drawn tail lamps with a new modern signature. Definitely looks a little bit more modern. And then the badge here with the GLE 350DE, D for the diesel, E for the electrification. So this one, the plug-in hybrid diesel version. Very interesting. We'll soon talk about the technology details. But one thing already in advance. Well, where did they put the battery? Not in the center of the car because it's not an EV platform, but really in the lower and so to say because they have modified the rear axle and some chassis parts in the rear area so they could fit the battery in there without any compromise or hardly any compromise on the interior we'll soon show you what i mean and the battery size is 31 kilowatt hours sometimes you know of a small pure ev and therefore also the promised range of about 100 kilometers or 60 miles and that's also you know pretty realistic as we also you know have found with the first driving test so one of the biggest batteries there is so far in a plug-in hybrid vehicle overall. Do you know any other PHEV that has this battery size? So this one, you know, will be very interesting for the driving part. And yeah, fake exhaust alert here. Those ones are pure fake exhaust on both sides. So whereas you can refuel the diesel on the passenger side, on the driver side, you can recharge right here and either with 7.4 kilowatt AC charging top part or the DC with 60 kilowatt so it also works on the stronger charging station and I mean for this kind of battery it indeed also makes sense to have a DC charger on board so far you get four and six cylinder petrol and diesels for the new GLE and there will be a petrol PHEV and here now the diesel PF. Diesel PF actually coming first in this case and the exact numbers are at the moment there's a GLE 350 that's a four cylinder petrol engine 300 horsepower then there's the 450 six cylinder petrol engine with 367 horsepower a mild hybrid and then there's the 300D four cylinder diesel 245 horsepower and the six cylinder diesel with a 350D 
with 272 horsepower. In this case here, it's again the smaller diesel. Although it's a 350 DE, it's the smaller diesel, the two liter four cylinder, but then with 320 horsepower system output. And the acceleration figure, and that's actually quite decent, it's 6.8 seconds to one kilometer source or 62 miles an hour. And by the way, there's also the 400D, this is the strongest diesel then so far. Forgot to mention that. So, the concept is really interesting. Again, this big battery, 31 kilowatt hours, and the high range. Diesel here all in the front, and they put the electric parts then rather in the rear. And of course, it always comes with all wheel drive. Still a real one with a rear wheel bias. What about that interior? Oh, doors closing sound, of course. Hmm, I mean, it's okay, but I've heard better ones, I have to say. Then, leather red on the inside here, wrapped tightly, beautiful quality, soft touch, and I really love this matte wood. That's really lovely, together with the Burmester sound system, great sound there. Of course, an option. Reasonable door pockets on the inside. And then high-class interior also stepped up the game if you compare to the predecessor generation. This two times 12.3 inch screen setup, you will soon take a deep look at that. Of course, really impressive right there. Then again, the matte wood here. And the seats today, those ones are the animal skin seats. But the GLE does offer a lot of animal-free materials. As for the seat, Artico or MB Tex leather red in different colors. And also, if you want an AMG line, you can get the Dynamica microfiber on the inside and leather red on the outside. So they do have a lot of choices. Nice integration also for the LED ambient light here. When you look at this middle console where you have those handles. So everything has a very central design. So as for the interior design, the GLE is among the leading in this full-size SUV segment. Steering wheel also completely new for this generation. And let's get inside. and. It's really great from the seat form. The GLE, one of the most comfortable SUVs you can get at the moment. It's just great. You can drive miles and miles and miles and it won't matter. I'm one meters 86 or six foot one. That leaves still headroom, even though there's this panoramic roof, which you can also open. And you would have a little bit uh, more headroom, of course, if you would go without the panoramic roof. But here, this is of course pretty cool, it's bigger than before and then it leaves a lot of fresh air in so that might also be something to enjoy while driving. Oh and have you seen this crystal somewhat layout for those middle lights? This is beautifully done together with the bright ceiling and the very big cover right there and a light that you can check yourself out <laughs> at some point. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you need to do that. So then here steering wheel also with an electric control and everything feels and looks quite solid cruise control will be controlled here left side of the steering wheel but let's also dig deeper now to all those you know infotainment system units well mercedes certainly knows their uh, stuff <laughs> with ambient lighting ocean blue purple sky and look how the ambient lighting is integrated right there that is so beautiful done red moon mm, or fire red that's really cool. And again, a central design. Yeah, you can argue about this if it's maybe too much, but again, this matte wood surface is pretty cool. Then soft touch dashboard and a clean integration of those screens. So I think that's definitely well done. This right screen, either we are touch, so that is possible, or you can use your right thumb for that. So redundant controls, or the lower pad is also possible to swipe left and right with that and press the home button yeah those thumb pads right and also left and left side would then be for those digital instruments and you can also get different stylings for this one classic or sport for example if you want a little bit sporty that takes some time to load then then you also have the consumption meter in there and everything pretty clear to read yeah maybe the, like the top edges blocked by the steering wheel but that's okay here it's not like in Porsche where we can uh, sometimes just see half of that you can also have the GPS information in the middle 
middle side, uh, my middle part right here. You can also see something off the map. That's cool. But there's also a huge head-up display. We soon um, take also more detailed shots of that. It's really a great projection. Soon also a little bit more details to the infotainment screen on the right. Oh, Jonas, do you want to do it now? Yes, want to do it now, right? Because I want to show you the GPS here in detail. Also responsive clear visualization and so on and you can use this um, MUUX system for example with hey Mercedes How may I help you? please drive me to Berlin please select an entry so that's you know route guidance wherever. is starting so that's you know putting in the GPS, but it also works for temperature. Or you can ask, um, for example, to to open the sunroof or to close it. May, we can try. It. Hey, hey, Mercedes. How may I help you? Please open the sunroof. I'm opening the roller sunblind on the sliding sunroof. So in this case, we have the slide already open. So, but the, uh, she said that she would do that. So. We trust in her, right? Don't we? <laughs> so that about the MBUX. And then we move further down where we still have this climate unit. That's a nice effect. And also, especially at night, when you put it to red or warmer, the ambient light also reacts to that in the same way when you go to the blue and a little bit colder. Clicking sound. Yeah, accept it. And then also matte wood cover here for the lower console. The less piano, lacquer and black, the better, I think. And this touchpad, you can still use them for redundant controls. But also for the driving modes, we will, of course, rather go to the electric driving modes here for today. And then there's also a separate camera button, for example. Let's just st start up the car and then use the camera button right there. I think that hasn't started yet. But I want to show you the rear view camera, which has a great resolution. And also the lines move accordingly, for example. And then there's also a drone view from above let's see this one this button also is used for example for the self parking function then there's the front camera split then here also for those wheels that you don't damage those so if you go for this highest or more sophisticated building stage of the camera a lot of possibilities well and then of course when we slide this lower part open this is interesting because we have the apple carplay available i have USB-C ports, two, one for connection, one for charging in the front. But this one would be also an inductive charging pad, but they don't offer a wireless connection yet. So I would rather stick it with the cable connection. I will soon again also show the integration. First of all, the cup holes are adaptive in the front and you can heat or cool them right there in the front. That's cool. Okay, that, that was a little bit cheap to say, but why not? <laughs> so and then we can go up a little bit more again and I want to show you the Apple CarPlay integration right there. It's going in the lower part. They don't use all the way off the screen, but I think it's still okay. And of course, um, there's you know really nice sound from this Burmester sound system. It really sounds very sophisticated 3D sound. And the split opening, meanwhile copied by a lot of companies in the business. Here they had it earlier, of course. USB-C port, another one, and some cubby hole to store stuff. Now look at that head-up display. It's even bigger than you might imagine in real life and it shows the current speed, a loud speed, and also some GPS direction and also even part of the map when you have a route running. Why have the Mercedes engineers you know, had so much effort with modifying rear axle, rear chassis compartment and so on? Well, it's because of the rear compartment. First of all, again, this beautiful matte wood insert. We will take this for it. Yeah, it's somewhat classic, but classic, cool. <laughs> then again, the LED ambient light, you can change the color, by the way. And then you can see you have also reasonable space on the inside. Same design as in the front, of course, depending on the style you pick for those seats. Isofix at the outside parts each. The, you know, behind the co-driver seat, you see there's a car uh, cable lying around at the moment. We have it here that we have a clear trunk soon to show you. And now the big question is, is there any compromise as for the rear bench? And that brings me back to my initial comment. No, there's plenty of legroom available. That's also a you know, strong thing here of the new GLE generation because the wheelbase is, I think, was six centimeter increase here with the new generation. And 
still works with the headroom even though we have the panoramic roof. The thing is, it leads the X5 for example in legroom. But then again this seat bench here that falls a little bit backward, I think that's not good for comfort. I, we, I read some, com uh, some co um, comments of you guys, some guys were saying it's better for comfort. I mean it depends maybe on the body, but for me it's more, you know, comfortable when I sit a little bit more upright. So like those captain chair setup we had in the X7 for example, that was like amazing for a rear seat. But here, but the thing is you have more legroom then and you have also more headroom. And again here in the PF version it will be the same for the petrol and for the diesel. You don't lose any height or something, so that's pretty cool and a great achievement. Then you can flip this bench all the way right here. Two thirds, one third split. The middle part is reserved for cup holders. They are also adaptive. And last but not least, oh, there's this car cable now here in the lower end. You have two USB-C chargers and there's also this rear climate unit. We need to power the car for that, but uh, here you can also have all this climate controls for the rear seats. Again, an option. Okay, Mercedes engineers, so you got us a nice bench and we don't lose any headroom, but what did you do with the trunk? Hmm, let's find out. <laughs> so, well, you do lose some in liter figures, whereas the absolute maximum figure would be more than 2,000 liters in the normal version. It's the cover here. It's a little bit wobbly, of course, here, because, you know, there's this optional uh, seven-seater program, not for the PF, but for the other ones. Here, you're about 1,900 liters, so you lose a little bit in liter figures and not in length. That's the same, because here the normal length is about a meter, maybe a little bit more, but very well usable, cool square dimensions. You can lower the car if you like when it has the optional air suspension. Steel suspension would be standard. The um, e-active body control, the special suspension which can lean in the corners, not available for this one because of packaging reason. And here, usually we, we could put this one here up, you know, there's like space underneath, but this is not possible. And this is the only space you lose, so you lose then a little bit in height, but rather what's beneath that. So to this top cover right here, it is still about, yeah, about a little bit more than 40 centimeters and that's totally acceptable, I think. And the width, by the way, usually about a meter, but here is even more. So it's about, yeah, a meter, over a meter, meters and five or something like that. So very well usable, hardly any compromise here for the PF. I think that's pretty cool. Again, the EQ, the pure EQ models will be all electric and EQ power will be the PFs. And if I remember it correct, the EQ boost and then the mild hybrid. So that's, you know, their new naming system for their somewhat, to which extent, wherever, electrified models. And of course, at the end of a trunk, let's see the maximum capacity. This is the 12 volt power supply. <laughs> that looked like a flip for, uh, for a second. So many SUVs I tested recently. Didn't remember that there was no flip here, so we have to go all the way around here. And then we can also test the final length, of course, too. So here we go. And well, I usually test the absolute length to the seat as I would be driving. I mean, this is a nice setup. And if you remember the first time they did the diesel hybrid, it was an E class, for example. And if you think about the um, petrol plug in hybrid in the C class, that was horrible from the trunk. Do you remember that C-Class PF? There was like, you could hardly fit anything in the trunk then, but here I think very well done and almost two meters now to my seat as I would be driving. So what do you think guys? Of course, that's the biggest advantage. The car is already on and it's absolutely silent. That's of course cool. And it tells me, by the way, the total range of 850 kilometers and the electric range of about 100 kilometers. And the board computer is calculating that also based on, you know, what was done before. And the cool thing is, you know, when I'm just easing around here, we got a nice pool here next to us. Actually, we've been around here with the Opel Corsa already and really nice location 
and I'm just easing around the car here, here and testing the rear view camera. Great resolution for that, fake drone view from above, together with that. And this is, you know, a really cool use case for this plug-in hybrid vehicle, because when you, you know, just in your neighborhood, for example, or you're searching a, a spot to park your car or something, then you, you don't annoy anyone and locally you don't emit any emissions. And this is actually pretty nice. And of course, it's the same for a diesel or also for a petrol hybrid. And this silence also fits to the overall very comfortable character of the car. Also looking at this huge head-up dis head display. So it's a very, very big projection. We already noticed that, noticed that when we had the GLE for the very, very first time. So I want to get rid of the camera and go back to the navigation system. So we also have some nice room for you planned. Really tricky situation here, but then again, it's absolutely silent here because this car is so well insulated also. I mean, it's, I'm not sure if you can really pick that on camera. I really hope so. It's so absolutely silent in here. That's really amazing. So, and well, I talked to the engineers before, you know, PHEVs, some say it's the best of two worlds and some others say it's the worst of two worlds. Augmented reality right here in the GPS, you can very well see that. Now guiding me where I have to go. And this again, a good situation for the PHEV once more, being stuck in traffic partially. And again, the combustion engine is off and we're just rolling electric. So in this case, it's really good to have some traffic to test those situations. And now again, augmented reality showing me where to exit the roundabout actually. And you know, the engineers said that, of course, in general, when you are using your car with a normal combustion engine, don't start it and hammer the throttle. The car can do that, yes, but that's of course not good for the car in general. But then what about this plug-in hybrid? Because when you drive it, let's say just electric, and then at some point you hammer the throttle, then the combustion and it is cold, be it the diesel or the petrol also. First of all, emission wise, they told me because of those, you know, very elaborate filters they use, it would not be a problem. So the emission would be held back by the filters. Then again, is it good for the engine? Mm, yeah, that's something else. So it is in general not recommended to hammer the throttle when the engine is cold. So I guess the thing is, when you are at some point where the combustion and it sets in, it's also good to be gentle with it. They say, of course, they build in a way, the plug-in hybrids, they are a little bit stronger as for some certain engine parts, they told me. And so they would also sustain it a little bit better. However, I think it is recommended when you then keep it a little bit steady when the engine is about to set in for the very first time. When we were starting up the car, by the way, when you start it in the electric mode and then you leave it like this, it's not as with other plug-in hybrid where they, for example, reset the mode to a specific mode where the manufacturer said, this is the best one. Here, when you, when you leave the car in electric mode and you start it up again, it will stay in the electric mode because they say, probably that's what the customer wanted. And I think that's also a wise, wise decision, definitely. Maybe you are commuting to work every day electric and then on the weekend you're driving with the diesel. That would be the optimum use case of this vehicle. And then you charge at home overnight, for example, that also a normal household block will probably be just sufficient. And that's it. So that's definitely a very interesting approach. And so far, I mean, we can also check it out here as long as we are in this um, EQ power mode right there, then we drive all electric and the car is basically rolling. So that's on the one hand, the most efficient way. And when I'm going on the brakes, first the recuperation is being used. And then when I need even more braking power then the normal brakes are being applied. But in most cases in everyday driving life, the recuperation then is enough. You can, however, also change that. For example, here with the pedals. So, for example, you can click here and see D plus. That is then, it's like, I'm just rolling, 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 rolling. <laughs> and then I can use the brake. I mean, you could say, 
you know, this would be an experience you might want to have, then you just do it like that. There won't be like less recuperation or something. But maybe, oh, there's a real eco P, but that's of course the previous generation. But then I can also use the pedals from the left, go to D mode, D minus, or D minus minus, and then I have more recuperation. It's not a very harsh recuperation as you would maybe have from like an all electric vehicle, like we know from Tesla or something. But they have those steps that, you know, with the D minus minus mode, it's rather that you just lift the throttle and the car is decelerating a little bit by brake recuperation. So this would, let's say, come closer to this one pedal feeling. So here now, yeah, I mean, the recuperation is not super strong, but you definitely feel a difference where, you know, when you're on this plus mode, then the car just keeps rolling. So, yeah, here now, for example, I feel that, um, it, yeah, it could be useful for the city, especially here when being stuck in traffic and it's stop and go. And again, it's maybe not the most exciting one to drive slowly, but what we're doing here at the moment is the optimum use case for this car. You start, you know, in the city traffic, maybe leave your office, then you can use some recuperation again when braking and driving the city here, no local emissions. And then you head on to the motorway maybe to your final destination and then the diesel gets active and is actually the most efficient engine when you like driving 100, 120 kilometers an hour or like 60, 60, 80 miles an hour, then definitely um, it, it makes sense to use the diesel. So when this is the case, then this car, this combination makes sense for you. And also financially wise, if there are some governmental benefits, this one will be one of the cheapest GLE to run when you're using um, you know, this German tax model where you use a company car also for private purposes and usually you tax with 1% of the list price per month additionally and that way at the moment rule is in Germany for the PFs and the EVs you just have to pay half so 0.5% per month so you save massive amounts of money when you go for that then that could be you now the very interesting aspect as for that and I can just stress again the electric drive really fits to this vehicle. Big SUV electrified works absolutely nicely. Oh, the speed camera. So, and this, you know, this battery is really large, 31 kilowatt hours, about one kilometers of electric range. So I hardly haven't had that in, oh, interesting. Driving with a cart on the street. Even had a, a license plate. Wow, that's, that's astonishing. So, yeah, one of the very uh, rare cases where I was somewhat happy to have traffic to be able to, to demonstrate that really well. Maybe we can also see how this cruise control works, if it also works here in, in the traffic. And that's a very clear view to all of the instruments. Also, the build quality has been set up. I really like the, you know, the interior here with the matte wood that also um, accounts for this very cozy and relaxed driving feeling of the GLE. We already had it in the petrol engine, but here, Acceleration also just pure electric. That's cool. It's actually quite spontaneous and quite powerful. So it's not that you would go for the for the electric drive mode and then there's nothing you you, you can have. So um, we also as soon as we can drive a little more freely, we try to push it a little bit harder and see also how the combustion engine um, acts then. But so far, we really have to say when you in a situation like this, you know, oh, there's like a green traffic light. I want to catch that before it turns to yellow and, and then red. You saw that works pretty well. So you have enough. Yeah, that's maybe a little bit too risky here. So um, I could have done that, but I think, you know, with the trains, probably when they use those signals there, you know, you know, they think about that the train is coming. So you say no risk, no fun. But in this case, I think um, no risk is better. So we just wait for the train to pass by and then we just let the camera roll, edit out later a little bit. <laughs> if Jonas should forget to edit here, Jonas edit here. So here we are back again. I also switched the instruments now to a classic view. And so when I hit a little bit harder here now, still all electric and the acceleration from the all electric is actually totally fine. So I like that. Now to 70 kilometers an hour, I can also set the cruise control. Here we go. 
that's the normal cruise control at the moment, otherwise it would also adapt. But there's an adaptive cruise control in here, I think we have to set it first. So this limiter. Yeah. Set distance. So we can also play a little bit with the driving modes. So this one was the pure electric mode, so you try to keep it. If I go to battery level, however, see here, the combustion engine is on. You can also see the RPMs, and then the battery status is being held. That's, of course, not a situation that would just be something, you know, that would be relevant if, you, if you're entering a city where there is, for example, you know, the rule that inside the city you have to drive all electric. That will probably come at some stage, you know. Other than that, if you leave it, for example, in comfort, the car will decide on its own a little bit more when to use the electric and when to use the combustion engine. Here then, for example, when you're rather rolling, then the diesel is not really needed. And when I would pick up the speed a little bit more, you know, then the car would also change for that. And there's also sport. In this case, the combustion engine is being activated because with sport, the car gives you the full power, both of the petrol engine and of the electric engine. By the way, the engine has also said, yeah, because you have the plug-in hybrid, even if you do like a cold start of the engine, you still have the electric boost first. So the engine has like, you know, a second or two um, where it's not being used in a, you know, absolute harsh way. And that could be also better than to prevent any engine damages on the long run or so. So indeed, I think in, you know the questions you guys wrote concerning the PHEVs, you know, were pretty good. The engineers obviously say, you know, like everything, no problem. Yeah, of course they have to say that, but they also, you know, gave us some arguments uh, why that would be the case actually. Oh, that's the next traffic jam. But right here, accelerating in sport mode, you can see we keep it in the diesel. It's always on then, and you have both both powers. And yeah, it feels indeed different. When you hit the throttle here with this car, you feel somehow, you know, when you've driven little, you know, different kinds of vehicles, that you have this spontaneous electric acceleration. And at the same time, also the diesel then catches up after a second, and then you get the the real power so mm, so this electric help makes the driving experience a little bit more petrol like usually the diesel has you know this strong torque but it sets in together with the turbo and the petrol engine is you know coming from the low rpms and it's directly setting in and the diesel then maybe a little bit later but here with the electric drivetrain at the same time mm, yeah it moves rather in this direction the fuel consumption yeah, the question is, how much are you using this electric battery? And, you know, what's the consumption in there? Also totally depends on the driving profile. Um, you know, according to the driving cycle, about 100 kilometers range, 31 kilowatt hours, which is not the net usable battery capacity, it will be a little bit less. But then let me go back to the comfort mode again. So. And those big vehicles usually use like something between 20 and 30 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And again, it makes sense that the range is about 100 kilometers. So that will be then also approximate as for the, the, um, the consumption figure. Well, interesting, interesting. Left side traffic and right side we can all drive. It's because of this left turn there on the, on the next motorway. And just have to stress again, what a relaxed feeling with this car. Now in the comfort mode, again, the diesel is being activated. Here again, we're rolling down. I can just trust on the car to um, rule the recuperation also, but, you know, what, what the car thinks is actually best. Um, yeah, probably I'll, I'll drive on the right side here now because that's like too much traffic, definitely. Just go here first. Um, at the same time, you can also use it with the recuperation. So I think you would um, for example, just decide on your own, like what's what's the best way for you to drive. Is it better when you, for example, use more one pedal feeling, or do you rather want to let the car roll? You know, you can you can truly argue both. I think so. Both is somehow fun. Both is making somehow sense. Let's see also about this turning circle of the car. 
the optional air suspension, by the way, which is inbuilt right here. It's doing a good job. Just see, I'm turn the car around right here. This is also always good part of the test. See, like, how is it to ease the car around? And it is a huge car for European road. But then again, the steering here is very light to control. Then with this P-half, it's silent to ease the car around. So that, I mean, makes you also more relaxed when you're doing something like this and, you know, testing turning circles and searching for the next parking spot. So um, I really like driving those electrified vehicles even more if it would be in full EV, yes, of course, but they're not ready there yet with the GLE. So, so far, that's what we get. Here again, the recuperation is being used. There's also this charging meter you can always see. But after a while, probably you won't take a look at that, um, you know, so much. So, and now I want to be in sport and see what's the real acceleration. You know, the engine should also be warm a little bit. 40 to 70, let's go. Blop. That's already, that was already 80 now. So, yeah, I mean, over a 320 horsepower system output, the two liter four cylinder diesel together with this electric drivetrain. Of course, now we picked up more diesel sound, definitely, but it shows this also has enough power, although it's this, you know, very small displacement engine. But since it has this electric help, that's also totally fine. But most fun, definitely, in the electric mode, I pick it, then the RPM from the from a diesel directly drops down and we just continue driving all electric and if we think about you know a couple of couple of years ahead then this could maybe like pure battery based but again very big battery for a plug-in hybrid we haven't seen any other plug-in hybrid with such a big battery and then also this range so a lot of the drives you take with this car can actually be done pure electric then the question is also at some point are you really using the diesel? Yeah, but maybe there will be situations where you say like, you know, once a week or so, that will be enough. It will just not be good for the engine if you say like, you're driving the PF all the time, all electric, you're recharging it all the time and you're not using the diesel anymore. Then probably you need an electric car, but then you can pick the, the GLE. The steering again, very light, as I said earlier. So it's by the way, luggage on the behind, so we a little bit of space here for the ambulance. Oh, there's a doggy inside a chimney in the rear. <laughs> Just barely looking out the window, very sweet. GLE to me also among the most comfortable ones. Here, the air suspension is still a very comfortable one and I like to have this carpet air suspension right when I buy an air suspension. We had, you know, I really loved the BMW X5, yes. But I think the air suspension there, oh, now, of course, we can use the recuperation again. I um, wasn't really expected that they break that early. So now also the adaptive cruise control is being set by me. Um, so the air suspension here, definitely soft character. I think that's also a good and wise decision. So why would you put an air suspension in the car when you make it that stiff that you don't feel anymore that it's an air suspension? So that, that doesn't, you know, doesn't make any sense. But here, I think it totally makes sense. I should keep my hands on the steering wheel, even though we have this traffic assist running right now and the distance is being kept. The car always wants your hands on the steering wheel and yeah, sorry car, you're probably right. They're still a step ahead um, of us with the autonomous driving vehicles. So, so far we have those assistance systems here, for example, I'm not braking, I'm not accelerating. The distance to the car is being kept. We also have a blind spot monitor. I'm not sure if you can see it on camera. Um, there will be like this triangle in, 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 the, in the side of um, mirrors flashing. At the moment, no one can ever take us, but maybe you earlier you've seen it anyway. So this is definitely a good option. And of course, the autonomous emergency brake, that is standard with the car. Yeah, so the assistance systems, they are really very good. ACC and the blind spot monitor and so on. And the only thing I don't like is how the Mercedes cars, the newer ones, react on running off-road or like this, this lane departure warning. So um, from most cars, we know they use the steering intervention, but with the Mercedes, they often use the brake intervention and that can be a little bit harsh. So let me see if I can induce that. Of course, away, that's a new Ford Focus Active. 
state. So um, let's see when I you know maybe I'm tired or something. I don't pay attention and so on. And then I go a little bit too much to the right side. Let's see what the car does. Ah, at the moment, nothing. Okay, let's see. I set the cruise control and now I let the car run off. But I mean, just being very careful here and uh, always take the car in control. Let's see if the car here, here now. See here. There, the car was leading me. So that worked. But now again, yeah, I was cancelling. Um, but I had it just earlier situation um, where, the, where there was some braking intervention. It also showed me in the head-up display. And that was then again a quite harsh situation. It, it really depends. I think it's better now when we have like, you know, um, a road with, you know, with proper markings and so on. Then you can test that one better. Uh, but I think this brake intervention always comes a little bit too, too spontaneous, too hectic. So, um, you know, as long as it is being guided, is okay. But then again, this you know situation when you really try to run off, I think counter steering is better than brake intervention. Sometimes the steering here can be a little bit too light, maybe. Of course, it's not a car where we would expect a sporty driving feeling. Um, but maybe a little bit more feeling. You also have to steer quite a lot. That's, for example, something that pleased me a little bit more with the X5, that it gives a little bit more feeling for the steering wheel. And that it's still decently fun to ease this car around. And since you get along in most situations and with the electric drivetrain, you can also enjoy that to the max. So and that would probably also be the goal when driving this vehicle, to recharge it and really use this um, you know, this electric drive. At the moment, by the way, the electric consumption is quite decent. Here again, the augmented reality, they really know where to turn. We're about at um, just over 21 kilowatt hours per one kilometers. That would be um, acceptably low, um, even lower than the EQC we had in the test, for example. And this then would even mean, just let the bus pass here. This would even mean that we would have a higher electric range. This one because it was quite close in the front right there. And this is actually a perfect test round that we can use so much of this electric mode and it always makes sense. And now again, yeah, see here the power just um, until this car would switch to the diesel. And I think they really found a good threshold that you keep in this electric mode, but still have enough power, enough drive. And it's so much fun to accelerate this big SUV, which is, of course, even heavier with the battery pack. So much fun to accelerate this one out. Do I feel that this one here is heavier than the normal one? No, actually, no. I mean, um, you have this soft carpet ride, which I really enjoy. I would also probably stick with normal air suspension. You do not need this e-active body control, which is, I think, even not available for the um, plug-in hybrid because of you know storage and space issues and stuff. Uh, but the normal air suspension is absolutely fine, and I would also stick with that. Don't pay any extra price or something. And then you don't move it in a such a sporty way. But at the same time, although those cars are heavier on paper due to the electric drive, it somehow feels lighter than again because of this you know, rather spontaneous acceleration and so on. This is also what, what this car is about. So I think it's a very interesting concept, definitely. I would probably drive this car all electric all the time. But then the question is just like, what's the diesel for? But then again, if I drive like a, um, yeah, maybe I sometimes have some uh, ways where it's like 200 kilometers or something. And that of that and of course would just be possible with a diesel and you maybe have to return the very same day and you maybe don't have time to recharge then you would still be flexible and maybe then you have a diesel day and the other days are your electric days so that would be that transition it's it really is more fun to drive this car all electric than with any other drivetrain so i would just try to keep it electric the, you know, the, the, the more often that is possible. When I have a little bit more electric acceleration, then of course the electric consumption goes a little bit higher. 
and so far we haven't used you know we hardly haven't used any fuel so um, it's also quite astonishing but it's no wonder because there was like nothing which is like going high speed and so on and we're really using that power from the battery when there are more fast charging stations available with this ionity network where the German manufacturers predominantly work together for the European fast charging network which will then be an alternative to Tesla then of course it will be even easier to recharge but the fast charging is also more important for the pure electric vehicles the PHEVs will also be just fine you know with some other charging stations or you know, wall boxes or something what I want to test is um, when I'm in the all electric mode and really hammer through yeah then the diesel also gets activated so that, that would be in situation would, would, would be maybe not too good for the engine why are they doing that for safety reasons let's say there are situations you're getting on the motorway you need all electric mode it's like i really want to get on now before another car is jumping on and then you say oh it gets closed i really need some acceleration now for safety reason then you don't you know not supposed to pick any different driving mode you just hammer the throttle and then the diesel is picking it up as well that's why they do it in a way but again there's a certain threshold in the pedal you feel and the power you can get all electric from the acceleration is also just fine so what do we say it's the most interesting driving experience with the Mercedes GLE the electric drive very well fits to the overall character of the car which is cozy comfortable relaxing well insulated as for noise insulation and this carpet ride from the air suspension downsides yeah maybe technolo technology overkill if you argue that it's not the best but the worst of two worlds but that's again you know you can argue for both and both is somehow right you know um, it really depends on your driving profile if that is the suitable car for you so you just have to you know ask yourself when are you doing what certain routes when can you can you recharge and so on yeah the steering could be maybe a little bit more natural or a little bit more progressive other than that there's uh, you know hardly um, much to criticize uh, with this one quality issues that were with um, some GLE models um, recently um, also mentioned that they had those cars were brought over from Tuscaloosa US to Germany actually for some quality fixes and they also now changed the suppliers for the parts where there were some quality issues so they did react on that and um, also um, people who ordered, ordered the car will get that after of course those reworks have been done that's definitely also a very interesting story so of course i want to know you've seen also the other driving party from the gle if you have not seen that please do so so after the conclusion check out the video description for the other gle review watch that and then let's discuss here which drive friend you would actually go for Now to the conclusion for the day with the Mercedes GLE as the diesel PHEV. There will also be, as I said earlier, a petrol hybrid. So both will be available. So they are really electrifying their whole model portfolio. They also shown that here on the IAA Motor Show close by. It was very interesting to drive this one here today. First of all, the GLE new generation, a little bit more modern, not too revolutionary. Yes, interior, this one, you know, most changes. if you compare it to the predecessor generation with this horizontal infotainment layout there also very good voice control there they also have a lot of alternatives to animal skin especially here for the GLE so a good sustainable luxury is possible then the PF would also fit to that and the diesel you would use then for really long range and maybe the PF the electric part of that that then for your daily commutes this could be a good use case so if it makes sense it really depends on the use case it was impressive to have such a big battery in a plug-in hybrid that really also works with the high electric range so most of the ways you drive with this car you can do all electric would it make sense for your driving power fryer would like to hear your opinion in general the GLE remains one of the most comfortable SUVs on the market that's definitely pretty cool price wise of course will be pretty high but then again the PF no matter if it's diesel or the petrol later can make sense if there are those governmental tax benefits for that 
So, would it be something interesting for you? Then please tell me in the comments and hope you enjoyed this extensive insight with us here today. Also, for example, you know about, is it, does it really make sense, like best of both worlds or disadvantages of both worlds? I also talked a lot about that in the driving part. If you have missed that, re-watch it. And of course, also tune in to our petrol engine review of the all-new Mercedes GLE. Thank you so much.